day that'll be when Jesus comes and together we enter into his glorious presence. The wonderful reality is that Jesus beckons us from his sanctuary above to enter into his presence today. During our meeting this morning, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would touch our hearts in a very special way. Our chairperson this morning announced that I had retired. My wife teases me and tells me the only thing I have retired from is my salary. <laughs> when the general conference session took place in Atlanta, Elder Wilson, our newly elected general conference president, asked if I would stay on as his administrative assistant and so I have been doing that 50 percent of my time and then I work as an editor for the Adventist World and Review another 20 percent of my time and have some other projects as well so God has still enabled us to serve and we thank him for that. I want to talk to you about spirituality and ministry revival in our own hearts shortly after the general conference session I met with Elder Wilson and we began to talk about our leadership and God's desire to move powerfully in his church. We recognized with a world approaching seven billion people it would be almost ludicrous to think about reaching that world unless God did something special. And so we began to meet with a small group of general conference leadership team and study the Bible. We would study for an hour and pray for an hour. And Bible study groups broke out all over the General Conference Center and facility. We focused initially on the book of Acts and we opened the Word of God and we read chapter by chapter together. We analyzed what God was doing in the book of Acts and then we would kneel and at times be on our knees for an hour praying for one another, praying for our church, praying for the leadership team. We broadened that base to the departmental leaders at the General Conference and when our division presidents came in, we put agenda aside and we spent time studying the Bible, we spent time praying, we spent time seeking God. And we began to sense in our own lives, in our own hearts, a spiritual renewal. This morning I want to share with you the essence of renewal and what God is calling this church to and what he's calling ministry to in a deeper spiritual experience. Now I want to be very respectful of the seminars that are going to follow this. If God takes control of this meeting and if the meeting goes a little longer than we anticipated and you have prepared your seminar, don't be concerned about that. The value is that I have two meetings and I can shorten my next meeting so that we still will have that one hour or that 50 minutes that have been set aside for your seminar. So I know how it is. Sometimes I have been in meetings and I've sat there and I've had a seminar. I've spent all this time preparing and the speaker goes 15 minutes over and I say, my, I want you to know that we will be respectful of that and we can adjust in our next meeting. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for what you're doing among the administration and the pastors of this union. We thank you for the evident moving of your spirit in the meetings so far. And we pray now that you would come and take absolute, complete control. We pray that you'd lift our vision, that we can see Jesus in a new way. We pray that you'd help us to see our abject poverty without Christ filling our lives, that our spiritual impoverishedness, that our spiritual impotency without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And today, I pray thee that in this meeting, we would hear the voice of Jesus speaking to our hearts, that we'd feel the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, that we'd be touched by God, that this would be for us a life-changing meeting. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, a young boy by the name of Todd was brought to church for one of the first times by his parents. His parents weren't church-going people and they occasionally went on Christmas and maybe on Easter but that was it. And after they brought Todd to church that particular Sunday they were amazed at his prayer that evening. Todd seemed to like church a lot. The lad loved the singing. He even liked the preaching. He especially liked the fellowship meal 
and the three chocolate chip cookies and the two scoops of ice cream that he got after service. That night, as Todd knelt down to pray, this is the prayer he prayed. Dear Lord, we had a good time at church tonight. There was singing, there was praying, and there was preaching. Oh God, I wish you could have been there. If God does not show up on Sabbath morning in your church, it's all a sham, it's all pretense, it's all nothingness. I pray every time I go into the pulpit, God, you show up. God, you be here. God, you move by your Holy Spirit. God, you do things that I have not dreamed of in the heart and mind of my congregation. Is your church different because you've been there for three years, four years, five years? Do your elders struggle with the same jealousy, the same bitterness, the same anger, the same lust? Is the spiritual quality of your church different because you are known as a man, a woman anointed by the Holy Spirit? One who every time you step into the pulpit, every time you do a prayer meeting, every time you have a church board meeting, God comes down. Some man, some woman, some boy, some girl is changed. Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 3 and 4 says, Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads because the ground is parched. I say, oh God, may that not be a testimony of my ministry. That they come to my church and the ground is parched. There is no moving of the Holy Spirit at all. Oh God, when they come, may fountains of living waters flow through me because I've come to Christ and you're moving through my life and hearts are being touched and lives are being changed. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 says, and I will give you shepherds according to my heart. Oh God, as a pastor, oh God, as a preacher, help me to be a shepherd after your own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding every time I come into the pulpit, Lord. Help me as I open your word to feed your people from the scriptures so their lives are changed. Have you ever felt that you've run out of spiritual gas? Have you ever felt you were running on empty Charles Swindoll, in his book, Intimacy with God, tells about coming to a pastor's meeting. And at that pastor's meeting, he was sitting with a group of preachers at lunch. And one preacher said, Pastor Swindoll, can I talk to you privately? And so they sat down and met together. And the pastor said this, Pastor Swindoll, my spiritual gas tank is empty. I'm tired, exhausted, anxious, tense, filled with stress and I feel like I'm running on fumes. Have you ever felt that way? That your spiritual life is drained? That your prayer life is stale? That your Bible study life is boring? And that basically you try to go through the motions so that you have a pretense of ministry? Have you ever felt that way like this preacher? Have you ever felt that anxious and tense and filled with stress and anxiety? How can you have a sense that you're a God-called man, a God-called woman? How can you have a sense that your life is filled with Holy Spirit, that every time you go into that pulpit, you're making an impact on the hearts and lives of others? Duke University Divinity School has done a study recently on pastors in North America. And this is what they discovered, that the average American pastor spends about four hours every week or 35 minutes a day reading devotional or spiritual material. Is it possible to face the challenges of ministry on 35 minutes a day in devotional material? Is it possible to face the overwhelming obstacles we face in taking these cities for God if in our own lives there is a spiritual impoverishment? George Barner, who's written a number of recent books, one of them called The Revolutionaries, talks about people that are leaving the Christian church today. And he makes an interesting point. He says people used to leave the Christian church because they were not very spiritual, so they backslid or apostatized. But the point that he's making is that people are leaving this Christian church today 
not because they are less spiritual, but because they are more spiritual. There are millions of Americans in a new movement of home groups that believe the church is a bureaucratic institution and it gets in the way of their spirituality. Barner said this, eight out of ten believers in his research do not feel they have entered into the presence of God or experienced a connection with him during the worship service. Eighty percent of all Protestants going to church on Sunday mornings, and I pray God that that is not true in Seventh-day Adventist churches, but 80%, according to Barner's research, do not feel they've entered into the presence of God. Therefore, many of them, particularly young adults, are checking out on the church, not because they are less spiritual, but because they feel that as they meet together with their families and other families around tables, as they open the word of God and as they pray, it is more spiritual nourishing for them. I pray that every Seventh-day Adventist church will be a dynamic center of spiritual worship where the Holy Spirit is being poured out where people are coming down the aisle and being transformed by the grace of God, where people are standing giving their testimonies that Jesus transformed their life, where every Adventist pastor walks into the pulpit and opens the Word of God and the Spirit of God comes down and people come down on their knees and are confessing their sin, that indeed our churches are New Testament-based churches where the power of the Holy Spirit comes down and is poured out. Resurrection power can transform us. The living Christ Christ can live again in my life and in your life as pastors and pastors' wives and church administrators. This is no time for playing church. This is no time for fooling around. This is no time to go through the motions that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with might through the spirit in the inner man. That he may grant you, oh God, come Move in my life through your spirit. Strengthen me inside by that spirit. Socrates once said, let him who would move the world first move himself. Leonard Ravenhill, that great revivalist, said, before a man can rise to shake the world, some great truth must rise in his soul to shake him. The greatest compliment you can get in your preaching is preacher, when you preach today, it was like you learned it yesterday and could not wait to tell it today. I pray that the story of the cross never gets old. That the story of the sacrifice of Christ never becomes mundane. That every time I come into the pulpit, it is as if I was redeemed yesterday. And Jesus moves through me today. Unless there is in us that which is above us, we shall be like that which is around us. Unless there is in us that which is above us, we shall be like that which is around us. E.M. Bounds, great revivalist, said, we've emphasized sermon preparation until we've lost the most important thing to prepare, be prepared, the heart. A prepared heart is much better than a prepared sermon. Oh God, prepare my heart. Prepare my heart on my knees before I preach. Prepare my heart when I stand before your people. Do something in me so you can do something through me. Do something to me so you can do something with me. Alexander White put it this way, a congregation is waiting to be made by you after you are made by God. A congregation is waiting to be made by you while you are waiting to be made by God. I love what W.H. Criswell said, Oh, that God's messenger may say, I wasn't wrapped in academic robes on the Lord's day. I wasn't hiding behind degrees on the Lord's day. I wasn't trying to say what men would say on the Lord's day. When I walked into the pulpit, maybe poor English. Remember, Dwight Moody was preaching one day, and a lady came to him and said, Pastor Moody, she was an English teacher, praise God for all those English teachers in the audience. She was an English teacher and she came to Moody and she said, Moody, do you know you made 42 grammatical errors in your sermon today? And Moody said, my dear, 
I'm using all the English I know to win souls to Jesus. What are you doing with the English you know? When I walked into the pulpit, maybe poor English, maybe faulty construction, maybe homiletically unsound, there I stood. As I was in what I could do, that I did say and preach in the power of the Spirit. For I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. May every Adventist preacher, I pray that God will give us theologically accurate, homiletically sound sermons. That is absolutely fundamental. But all the academic soundness and the homiletical exegesis that is accurate and the theological integrity without the unction of the spirit is cold barren formality that will not transform a life when I walked into the pulpit that I did say and preach in the power of the spirit for I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. A preacher must be formed before they're informed. Now let's spend a few moments today looking at two things, how that happens. How God can work in your life and mine to prepare us to be filled with the Spirit, to transform lives in our congregations. I want to look at two things. First, the prayer life of Jesus and make some applications to our lives. And secondly, the Bible study life of Jesus. Because it is through knowing God that we can share God. No superficial religious experience will do. If you are an administrator here today, a conference president, a union president, ministerial secretary, treasurer, church officer, and in your heart you know you're going through the motions. In your heart you know you've lost it. I pray God will touch you today. If you're a pastor and you're going through the motions and you know it, I pray God will touch you today. What is spiritual revival? It is the renewal of a deeper experience with Jesus on a daily basis. Revival is not an event in the life of the church. It's an ongoing daily experience. The prayer life of Jesus, let's take a look at it. There are three things I want to notice about the prayer life of Jesus. We find them in Mark chapter 1 verse 35. The scripture says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. There are three things about the passage that are worth noticing. One, in the morning, risen, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus had a time to pray. Two, he went out into a solitary place. Jesus had a place to pray. Three, he prayed. How did he pray? We'll take a look at that. There are three aspects. First, Jesus had a time to pray. Do you have time to pray? Do you have a time to pray? I've had people say to me, pastors, in fact, Pastor Mark, I just kind of dart a prayer all the time. That's kind of like saying I just eat a little food all the time and I don't have a regular time set apart to pray. Sometimes the most basic things, the most fundamental things are the most powerful. Is there a time in your life and in your ministry throughout every single day that you have time to pray? You know, one of the things that's killing us today are labor-saving devices. I remember when I was with It Is Written Television, we were getting about 200,000 requests a year, many letters, emails, obviously I didn't have to answer them all, but I answered many of them, trying to write books, doing 35 new television scripts a year, raising about $10 million a year. The North American Division uh, financed the media center, but our ministry was receiving in direct subsidy about 100000 a year. And, we had to raise, at that time, our budget was $10.2 million a year. So I knew I had to raise $900,000 a month. And if we didn't raise that, we laid off staff or cut stations. I recognized as well that evangelism was my calling. And I was traveling like everything across America, holding four or five evangelistic meetings a year. So here you're writing books. you got 200,000 letters coming in. And sure, we had a staff. I acknowledge that. But at times, I felt so incredibly overwhelmed. And I can remember going into my office, 
cell phone. My staff said to me, Mark, you need a cell phone because that'll save you a lot of labor. Well, I got a cell phone. Then they said, you need to be sure that you answer all these emails. Then you get text messaging. And pretty soon, the time to be alone, the time to be quiet. And I can remember time after time going into my office and I had my devotions early in the morning, but I would go in at 10 o'clock in the morning. I would work until 10, and I'd say to my secretary, from 10 to 11, I want nothing now. I just need time to be alone with God. I need time to pray. And those times of saying to my secretary, look, I'm taking this afternoon off. I'm going to hike and sit by a rock and get my head together and pray. Unless you are fueled by the Holy Spirit, unless you have a time to pray, Ministry is going to become exhausting and you are going to burn out. But ministry can be the most exciting life possible. For the last 43 years I've been preaching and I hope to God I preach 43 more. I love evangelism. I love ministry. I love sitting down with some person and opening the Bible and seeing them kneel and come to Jesus and getting my arms around them. I love standing before an audience in any place in the world and preaching and seeing those people come down the aisle. I love kneeling and praying with people. That which fuels your ministry, that which keeps you excited about ministry and thrilled about ministry is knowing God. If you don't know God, ministry is rough. If your spiritual experience is slipping through your fingers, ministry can overwhelm you. Jesus understood that. He was the prime preacher. He understood the challenges of ministry because he was one. He understood the pressures. He understood the difficulties. He understands you and me. And Jesus touched the eyes of the blind and they were opened. He touched the ears and the deaf and they were unstopped. He broke the bread and he fed the 5,000. Jesus preached and ministered and taught. And on the hillsides of Galilee, gave that magnificent Sermon on the Mount as Jesus ministered physically, mentally, spiritually to people. He recognized that in a life of giving, he could not make an impact on hearts and minds and lives unless power came from the Father. So Jesus had a time to pray. Do you have a time to pray? A time set apart every single day to pray. R.A. Torrey said, we are too busy to pray so we're too busy to have power we have a great deal of activity but we accomplish little many services but few conversions much machinery but few results oh God may the power come again through us in our pulpit ministry in our counseling ministry in our Bible study ministry in our administrative ministry because we have not been too busy to pray Ellen White volume 6 page 47 adds communion with God through prayer and the study of his word must not be neglected for here is the source of his strength no work for the church and she's speaking about preachers should take precedence over this Pastors are the only people in the world that are paid to pray and study the Bible. Only people in the world that are paid to pray and study the Bible. You see, no work for the church to take precedence over this. Our relationship with God is more important than the work that we do. You can do without being but you can never be without doing when I am God's man and his spirit fills my heart and his love breaks my heart it leads me and prompts me to be more active in service and ministry and gives more effectiveness the Bible says Luke chapter 9 verse 29 one of the things that I've done recently is taken the Gospel of Luke and looked at the prayer life of Jesus. There is more about the prayer life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke than in any other single uh, Gospel. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. This is the transfiguration, Jesus on the mountain praying. He knows he's going to face Pilate's judgment hall. He knows he's going to face the Roman lash. He knows he's going to face the nails through his hands. He knows he's going to face denial by Peter and betrayal by Judas and rejection by the Jews and crucifixion by the Romans. All that is before him. And Jesus comes to the Mount of Transfiguration and there he prays. 
face, and his face glistens like the sun. And God sends Moses and Elijah to talk to him. And what do they talk to him about according to Luke chapter 9? His decease, his death. There God sends, in answer to Jesus' prayer, the specific ones who can encourage him most. Moses talks to Jesus about the reality of the fact that many like him who were died and were resurrected from the dead will be resurrected when Jesus comes. Elijah talks about the reality of the fact that many will ascend to heaven and never die when Jesus comes. The Bible says that Moses and Elijah tells us what they talk to Jesus about, his decease. And the Greek word for decease has its root in the word exodus. What is an exodus? It's a journey into the unknown. Jesus was going into the unknown. He was going into the tomb. He was going to hang on the cross. He was to bear the condemnation and the sin of all humanity. He was going on an exodus, a journey into the unknown. This week for you is a journey into the unknown. That phone call that comes at 2 o'clock in the morning, a journey into the unknown. Challenges on your church board, a journey into the unknown. We're making a commitment to be God's man, God's woman, to reach your city for Christ, a journey into the unknown. Strength for the journey into the unknown comes in the quiet place of prayer with Jesus. Review and Herald, August 8, 1878. The praying minister, I love this, the praying minister, who has living faith, will have corresponding works and great results will attend his labors despite the combined obstacles of earth and hell. The praying preacher who comes into the presence of God, who receives power from God, that praying preacher will have great results. God longs for your ministry not to have mediocre results. God longs for your ministry not to have minimal results. God longs for your ministry to have great results. As we come into the presence of God, God does something in our hearts and lives. Ministry is not merely intellectual persuasion or unusual charisma. Ministry is a spiritual entity. We have come to God. He's transformed us. And he pours out his spirit as living water through the channels of our lives to touch others. Jesus had a time to pray. Secondly, Jesus had a place to pray. The Bible says, Luke 5 verse 16, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Notice the word often. Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness. Jesus had a place to pray. You know, I did not grow up in a Seventh-day Adventist home. And I remember on Friday nights after playing basketball, I'd come home and lie in front of the television and watch the late, 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 late show. And I'd look through the crack in the door, and my dad was a Seventh-day Adventist. We didn't have a lot of money in those days, and there was an old black and white vinyl chair with stuffing coming out. And I'd see dad. That was dad's prayer place. I knew it. That was dad's prayer place. And on Friday night, he'd be kneeling by that chair. And he'd be praying, oh, Lord, bless my boy. You know, he doesn't have much interest in you, but bless my boy. Dad's prayer place was that chair. I have some friends that when their children become 8, 9, or 10, they buy them a little prayer rug, hand-woven, and they place it by their bed, and they say, this is your special prayer place. Do you have a time to pray as a preacher? A time to pray. Or just as you say, I'm going to eat breakfast every morning at 7.30, lunch at 1, supper at 5. Do you have, really, do you now? Do you have a time to pray that is set aside that nothing affects that time? Do you have a place to pray? That study where you prepare those sermons and you kneel by that chair and pour your heart out to God. That the bedroom where you close the door and get on your knees and cry out to God. Do you have your special prayer place? That place where you've sought God when you've had a problem on your church board and you've seen him move on the heart of that hard-hearted deacon or elder in the next board meeting, it was much softer. That place when you were going to burn off, were you going to pay the mortgage of your church 
and you needed $2,200 a month and you were only taking in $1,400. And that place that you went again and again and again and sought God for those finances and you saw God come through. That place that you knelt and prayed for your city. That place that you knelt and prayed for those handbills. Do you have a time to pray? Do you have a place to pray? That trail that you walk out on behind your house, that rock that you kneel at, do you know experientially, deep within the fabric of your being, what it means for God to answer specific prayers? Is your life being transformed by the Spirit? Dwight Moody put it this way, the world has yet to see what God will do in and for and by and with the man that is totally consecrated to him. I will be that man. I will be that man. John Bunyan said you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. Jesus had a time to pray. Jesus had a place to pray. And thirdly, Jesus' most powerful prayers were verbal and out loud. Now let's unpack that just for a moment. Jesus' most powerful prayers were verbal and out loud. Now obviously, you can pray at any time in any place silent prayers. But has your mind ever wandered when you prayed? How many people have ever had their mind wandered when they pray? I got a few honest preachers here. Um, uh, my mind has wandered regularly when I pray. You know, you're kneeling down praying, and then you begin thinking about this problem, you begin thinking about that problem. When you pray out loud, the brain must engage to verbalize the verbal language. Therefore, your mind is concentrated. When you kneel before God praying, now there's a number of examples of this in the Bible. For example, the Gethsemane experience. Three times in Matthew 26 and Luke 22, it says, Jesus knelt down and prayed, saying, not my will, but thy will be done. He knelt down and prayed, not thinking, but saying. In Luke chapter 11, when you have the Lord's Prayer, the disciples come upon Jesus and they've heard him praying out loud. In Hebrews chapter 5, it talks about Jesus' prayers, and it says he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who is able to save him from death. So Jesus prayed out loud. No, I've had people say to me, but pastor, if I pray out loud, the devil's going to hear me, so I pray silently so the devil does not hear me. Is the devil omniscient? Does he know everything? Is the devil omnipresent? No, the devil's a single being. He can send his evil angels, but when you're praying, God surrounds you with good angels, and the host of hell trembles, we are told. The last place the devil wants to be when some preacher is on his knees pouring out his soul to God is there, because good angels wing their way from worlds afar, surround you, encourage you, give you new hope and confidence. Ellen White puts it this way, our high calling, page 130. Learn to pray aloud where only God can hear you. Learn to pray what? Aloud, where only God can hear you. As we pray, angels come, give us hope, give us confidence. As we are on our knees, Jesus comes and speaks to us. Do you have a time to pray? That time that you have set aside, just for you and God. That time of uninterrupted fellowship with God. Do you have a place to pray? Do you know the joy of kneeling before him and pouring out your soul? Some of the richest times in my own devotional life have been kneeling with my Bible open, quietly in my study, praying through the Psalms, Using the Psalms as subject manner, matter of prayer. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Reading the Psalms aloud, 
letting God talk to me through the Psalms. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains carried into the midst of the sea. Lord, I'm fearful today, fearful about this church board, fearful about this committee at the GC, fearful about my kids. Lord, I have a lot of fear today, a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety. Fearful about my personal finances. Fearful about the finances of the church. Lord, I worry a lot about our city, the people that don't know Jesus. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Speak to me, God, through the Psalms today. Take away my fear. Enable me to have courage and hope. Draw me close to you. Do you have a time to pray? A place to pray. Day by day are you opening the word and letting God speak to you through his word as you speak to him. I love the words of the song, draw me close, let your love surround me, bring me near, draw me to your side. And now as I wait before you, let me fly like an eagle into your presence. Would you like to kneel this morning and say, God, change me inside. Lead me to a deeper relationship with you. Move in my life in a powerful way. Change me. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done in my life. But it's not enough. I want more. Before I can go home and lead my people into revival, my own heart must be revived. Before I can share your grace with others, I need an infilling of your grace. Before I can preach with power, I need to be empowered. Before you can do something through me, you must do something to me. Before you can do something with me, you must do something for me. Draw me close. Let your love surround me. Bring me near. Draw me to your side. Let's kneel together where possible. Let's sing that chorus together. Let's sing together. Draw me close. Okay. Okay, sing. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Sing the chorus like a prayer together. Draw me close. Draw me close. Let your love surround. Right. 
eyes up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. In the quietness, I want to give you a moment or two to spend time with Jesus. If there's somebody here and your relationship with Jesus has been slipping, he longs for you to return to his arms, he longs for you to return to his presence. He wants to know you more than at times you want to know him. If you're facing some challenge in your church, your ministry, talk to him about it. If administration has bogged you down in the mechanics of the church have overwhelmed you, talk to him about it. If your devotional life has been weak, and your prayer life has been minimal and your Bible study life has become a drudgery talk to him about it let God speak to you now let him renew your ministry in this place let him recharge your spiritual batteries in this place when every other voice is hushed let the voice of God speak to your soul in this place just now. Father, we sense in the stillness of this church sanctuary, we sense the moving of your spirit. We sense you talking to our hearts. We sense you leading us deeper. Father, we long for a revival in our church. We long to see Jesus alive in the resurrected Christ transforming lives. Father, we do not want to go through the mechanics of ministry. We don't just want to mark off Sabbath after Sabbath. We want to see the moving of your spirit. We long for you to transform lives. So we open our hearts right now. Revive us. Do something inside of us. Move with your spirit among us. And by faith, we thank you that you are. By faith, we thank you that for many of us today, this meeting in this place can be a new, encouraging, hopeful beginning for us. Thank you that no matter how much we have known you in the past, we can know you more. How much we've felt close to you in the past you want to draw us closer however much we've sensed your power working in our lives in the past you want to do more we thank you for that and reach out to grasp the reality of your presence in the living resurrected Christ send us from this place empowered by your spirit to touch others with your love in Jesus name Amen.
Father, we come to you. What a powerful message. And we just ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to be in this place. And Lord, we want to resemble you. We want to be like you. In your name, amen. Mm -hmm.